this is the third recap, uh, mission recap that I've done. Usually whenever a, um, a NASA mission ends, uh, one of the space probe missions ends, then uh, I sort of do a recap talk on it. And this one's coming in a bit late because uh, Cassini ended just over a year ago and I'm only now just getting around to talking about it, so you'll have to forgive me for that. But um, yes, Cassini uh, was the first space probe that we sent to Saturn that actually orbited around Saturn. And uh, just a very brief uh, summary of the mission, it was actually called Cassini-Huygens, uh, the full title of it. Uh, it was the first spacecraft to orbit Saturn and uh, launched in 1997 and uh, it orbited Saturn from 2004 to 2017 and the Huygens part, the Huygens probe, uh, was the first probe to ever land on Titan, which is the largest moon of Saturn. So uh, before Cassini, uh, before the Cassini probe, uh, we, hadn't, we had sent three other probes to Saturn. Um, the first one was Pioneer 11, and that probe flew by Saturn in 1979. And uh, so before this, all we had for Saturn was just telescopic uh, observations. This was the first probe to ever visit Saturn, and this is one of the pictures that it took of Saturn as it was going by. And uh, one thing that this probe did is it sort of did a uh, risky sort of pass uh, near the rings of Saturn. Uh, basically, it was to test because uh, right after the Pioneer probe, there were Voyager 1 and 2 right behind it and uh, they were both going to Saturn and basically they wanted to test and make sure that uh, the trajectory was safe for those probes so that it wasn't possibly going to fly through the ring particles and get sort of battered and destroyed and they said well you know if any probe has to get battered and destroyed better this one than the much more uh, well equipped Voyager probes so really this was sort of the test uh, I guess, test dummy probe, but uh, it made it through, it made it just fine, so they didn't have to adjust the Voyager probes at all. But Pioneer 11 was the first spacecraft to ever visit Saturn, and then uh, shortly afterwards, Voyager 1 visited Saturn in uh, November of 1980. It also flew past Saturn, and uh, this is one of the pictures that Voyager 1 took of Saturn, and Voyager 1 uh, actually flew by, made a very close flyby of Titan, which is uh, the largest moon of Saturn, and also a very interesting moon, um, because it's very unusual. Um, if you don't already know, it's uh, one of the only moons in our solar system that has an atmosphere. Most moons, like our own Earth's moon, <coughs> they're basically just giant spheres of rock, which isn't particularly interesting, except if you're like a geologist or something like that. But Titan um, has an atmosphere made up of gases like methane, and um, it has, uh, well, I'll get to the other interesting features later because those are things that Cassini helped discover, but it's very interesting, very unique. And Voyager 1 flew by Titan and gave us some, some of the first up-close pictures of that. And because Voyager 1 flew by Titan, that basically sort of ejected it from the galactic, not the galactic, the uh, ecliptic, the plane of the ecliptic in the solar system, so it couldn't go on to fly by any other planets after that. It was slated to go fly by Pluto, but uh, they could either go to Pluto or Titan, and they chose to go by Titan. So uh, we didn't actually get any pictures of Pluto until New Horizons visited it just a couple of years ago. But we could have had those pictures in the 80s, but they decided to go to Titan instead, which I think was probably more interesting and a better choice. But anyway, Voyager 1 flew by Saturn in November of 1980, and then shortly afterwards, in August of 1981, Voyager 2 flew by Saturn, and here's a picture that Voyager 2 have took of Saturn. And so both the Voyager probes gave us a lot of useful information about the Saturn system, discovered a whole bunch of moons of Saturn uh, that were too small to be seen from the Earth, and um, yeah, it was just a very good, very informative flyby. But there's only so much information you could get when you're doing a quick flyby of a planet. Richard, and uh, yes, I don't mean to interrupt. go ahead. Do you remember when Voyager 2 was launched? I do not. I was not alive back then, but <laughs> 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 go ahead. Well, I, I don't the reason. It was almost a decade or something. Mm -hmm. Before it launched, do you remember something? Mm -hmm. Well, I was at the planetarium when it went by Jupiter, and mm -hmm. that was in the uh, early or uh, late 70s, mid yeah. and late 70s, that's when the Voyager went past Jupiter. Of course, it was longer, and it, but it had taken a <laughs> decade at 
lose. I think it was yeah. about a decade, right? And, and mm -hmm. I think that the two was launched before one, so they'd get to where they were yeah. going, one and two. Mm -hmm. Well, about this time in my career, I was doing a lot of work with uh, imaging systems, CCD cameras and stuff, mm -hmm. and in designing those systems. And we were working with state-of-the-art uh, CCD chips, right, and the resolution of those things. And <clears throat> we started looking at this data and saw the resolution of these cameras that they had sent 10 years earlier, mm -hmm. and we're just now being able to get our hands on it. Yeah. It was like, okay, that tells you something. <laughs> so, well, it went past uh, Jupiter, mm -hmm. NASA, uh, sent by courier or something, a package of slides, the 35 millimeter slides, and we got them around noon on a Friday, and we worked all afternoon and Saturday morning and made a planetarium show out of it and ran it Saturday afternoon oh, with yeah. an original <laughs> music score that wow. our technician came up with. <laughs> so it was, we were online, with, but we didn't, I wasn't there still when they went by uh, hmm. Saturday, so they yeah. had to do that. Yeah, well that's, that's interesting. You know, I walk by every every Sunday. I walk by the planetarium uh, workshop in the Pink Palace that they. I guess they don't really have need for anymore because it's all digital now. But yeah, I guess that's that's interesting to know that. But uh, but anyway, um, so there's Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2, and those were the three probes that had flown by Saturn before Cassini. And they gave us a lot of information, but there's only so much information you can get from a quick flyby. And basically, NASA wanted more, because um, they always want to know more. Um, so they decided it would be a good idea to send a probe to orbit around Saturn and basically uh, have a long-term study of uh, the Saturnian system. And so that's what Cassini was. So this is the Cassini-Huygens probe. And I'm going to really quickly sort of outline uh, what there is on this probe. So um, you're seeing a lot of stuff here, but I'll just tell you the important parts. Uh, right up here, this is a big satellite dish. That's the high gain antenna. They use that basically to talk to Earth because, of course, it's going all the way out to Saturn, so it's going to have to uh, receive instructions from Earth and send back its data and its pictures to Earth. So uh, that's one of the antennas. That's the big one uh, that they use to talk to Earth. And uh, over here are basically a whole bunch of cameras and radar uh, equipment just, you know, for taking pictures and for making maps of some of the moons of Saturn. Um, down here, these things, uh, those are the power source, so you might have actually noticed there are no solar panels on the probe at all. And the reason for that is, um, if you're going all the way out to Saturn, uh, that's a very far, that's really far away from the sun, so you're going to have a lot uh, less energy you're going to receive from the sun, so if you had solar panels, you'd have to have really huge, enormous ones to basically get enough energy um, to power the probe. And uh, that wasn't really feasible, so instead they decided to use little uh, pellets of plutonium. And uh, that's what's inside these little things here, uh, uh, just plutonium pellets, and they're constantly, the plutonium is basically decaying uh, constantly and that's giving off heat, and then they use uh, something called a thermoelectric generator, which basically takes the heat and converts it into electricity. And uh, that was basically a constant power source. They never had to worry about um, getting enough power from the sun or making sure the solar powers are pointed, uh, solar panels are pointed towards the sun or anything like that. But um, yeah, they had three of those there. Uh, right down here, these are two uh, rocket engines right there. Um, of course, there were other stages of the rocket, as you'll see in the next slide, that uh, launched Cassini. But this is all that was left of the probe when it actually got to Saturn. So it used these two down here to basically insert itself into orbit around Saturn. Um, and there are a bunch of other things here, too, like uh, magnetometers, uh, which measure you know, magnetic field and uh, things like cosmic uh, dust analyzers and stuff. But the other one right here, which is very, uh, has chosen a very da bad time to point away from us, but there it is. Uh, this thing right here, this big golden shield looking thing, that is the Huygens probe. Uh, that is the part of the probe that actually detaches from the rest of it and would go on to land on Titan. So uh, yeah, that's basically a brief overview of what was on Cassini on the probe. 
And uh, this is the rocket that launched it. It was a Titan IV rocket. Um, this is the actual one that Cassini was on, so it's somewhere right up there in this picture. And uh, it launched on October 15th of 1997 and uh, made it to Saturn in 2004. Now you might be thinking, gee, that's an awfully long time, uh, seven years that it takes to get to Saturn. Well, it actually didn't go directly to Saturn. You see, before you can go to Saturn, you have to go to Venus. Wait, what? Well, no, technically, you don't have to go to Venus first, but basically it was more fuel efficient for Cassini to fly by Venus and get what's called a gravitational assist, which is basically where if you fly by a planet, if your space probe flies by a planet in just the right way, it'll sort of, the planet will boost, give this uh, spacecraft sort of like a gravitational slingshot and make it go faster. And basically, um, if you saw my talk that I gave about a year ago about space flight, um, you'll know what the tyranny of the rocket equation is, which is basically um, the more fuel you add to your rocket, well, the more fuel you have to add to your rocket again. <laughs> because basically, uh, the more fuel you add, your rocket gets heavier, and therefore you need more fuel to make it to account for the added mass, and it grows exponentially. And basically, it's, you'd have to have a giant rocket to boost it all the way to Saturn without having to fly by anything. So they decided to trade um, fuel mass for time, basically. And so it flew by Venus, and then it flew by Venus again to get another gravitational assist. And then it flew by Earth, and then it flew by Jupiter, and then it got to Saturn. So that's why it took seven years. But um, yeah, here's the actual trajectory that it took. You can see it flew by Venus right there. And then here it comes, flies by Venus, then Earth again. There's Jupiter, it flies by Jupiter, and then eventually, you can see it's 2002, 2003, and in 2004, makes it to Saturn. So that's the trajectory it took, and, but as you, if, if this will loop again, you'll see it actually, instead of going out, it went in to go to Venus, and it didn't actually go all that far, as you can see, so the, the lion's share of the velocity it got was actually from these gravitational assists. So uh, yeah, very efficient, if not slow, uh, way to get to where you're going. Anyway. Still absolutely mm -hmm. phenomenal. Yes. That they can do that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, this is extremely hard to do if you didn't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Remember the protests? They lost them. There were protests? The Plutonian had to come by very pretty closely oh. and they were all worried. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're always going to be those types. But anyway, <laughs> enough, enough about that. Let's get back to space. Okay, this guy. This guy is basically the unsung hero of the Cassini mission, especially the Huygens part of the mission. Uh, this guy, Boris Smeds, he was a, um, I believe, sort of like a radio engineer for NASA. And he was, uh, the, the part where he comes into the story, Cassini was already in space. This was about a little under three years after it had launched. And basically his job was to use the Deep Space Network, which is basically a collection of radio telescopes around the globe. And his job was to talk to Cassini uh, using those radio telescopes and send it sort of some test data. And he was going to simulate the Doppler shift and uh, he was going to pretend, he was going to basically impersonate the Huygens probe and pretend to be the Huygens probe talking to Cassini and impersonate the Doppler shift that it would receive um, as it was sending its data back from Titan. And um, his job originally was just to make sure that it could receive the signal. But he was a bit stubborn. He didn't think that was good enough of a test to just see if it could receive the signal. He wanted to make sure it could receive it and understand the data that was coming in. And that was a bit controversial. Um, people didn't like that because basically time on the deep, sp uh, deep space network is extremely precious because um, there, there are only so many uh, radio telescopes you can use and you have to get your time basically at least six months ahead of time scheduled and it's about $20,000 a minute to use these things. And he wanted to do a really extensive test on the probe and make sure basically it could understand the Doppler shifted data and not just receive it. And uh, people didn't like that, but he basically had some contacts that he used, some strings he pulled, and uh, he was able to do his extensive test. And what he found was that the Cassini probe could receive the Doppler shifted data, but when he tried to read it back, basically, it came in all garbled. It didn't actually understand uh, the data because of the Doppler shift. So he tried playing around with it a little bit to see if he could make it work, and it didn't. So then he said, okay, I'm just going to try sending it a signal without the Doppler shift at all and see if that works, and it did. So basically, through his extensive uh, test that people really didn't want him to do, he figured out there was a big problem 
um, with a probe because it couldn't understand the data due to the Doppler shift. And then there was another even bigger problem they figured out, which is that the fix to that problem uh, they would not be able to implement because it'd have to be a software fix. And uh, apparently they weren't able to change the software once the probe was already launched and it had had already been launched at that point. So basically, the project was kind of in peril because at, for the current plan, there was no way to save it so that it could actually receive the data from the Huygens probe when it landed on Titan. So what they ended up doing was, since they couldn't fix the software, they basically changed the course of the probe, or they were going to change the course of the probe. Basically, after Huygens already landed on Titan, they were going to move Cassini in such a way that the Doppler shift would be minimized and so basically, there would not be as much of a Doppler shift. And so they tried again, they tested again, and it worked. So with their simulated less Doppler shift, it worked. But basically, because this guy was so stubborn, um, if he wasn't so stubborn, then uh, we would not have received any data at all from the Huygens probe as it landed on Titan. Boris Smed's unsung hero of the mission. But anyway, this guy, this guy deserves some credit. Anyway. Um, so that happened in February of 2000, long before Cassini got to, um, got to uh, Saturn. And then um, in December of 2000 is when Cassini flew by Jupiter. And um, we had already had a couple of space probes, like the Voyager probes, fly by Jupiter. I believe Galileo was actually uh, in orbit around Jupiter then. I might be wrong about that. But um, yeah, uh, Cassini flew by Jupiter, took a lot of pictures and uh, did a little bit, of, uh, little bit of science at Jupiter. Its main target was Saturn, but uh, it took some pictures, did a little bit of measurements, and uh, actually I believe they made a few discoveries thanks to um, the pictures and data it sent back about Jupiter, uh, specifically the clouds and which clouds basically were rising and which ones were falling, but um, that wasn't really the focus of it. Um, another thing it did in October of 2003, basically Cassini was in such a position that it was about to go behind the sun as seen from Earth. And so what they did is they performed a test of general relativity, um, which is basically a very, very summed down version of it, is the idea that massive objects, objects with a lot of gravity, bend space uh, a bit. And so basically, since the Cassini probe was about to go behind the sun, and the sun is a very massive object, um, they tested it to see if this general relativity theory would work, and uh, it did. Uh, basically, they predicted, uh, they knew where Cassini really was. Um, it was over here or so. Uh, this is actually a diagram showing a star, but just imagine that's the Cassini probe for now. And uh, so it was really over here, and the signal they got from it was actually, uh, seemed to be coming from over here. And um, they had done this with other probes, of course, when they went behind the sun, but the Cassini probe was, at the time, the best measurement they had done, and uh, it increased their confidence in the theory of general relativity, uh, decreased the error margin by about 100 times or so, and uh, the measurements they got perfectly uh, coincided with Einstein's theory, so that was another thing that uh, the probe did. And finally, uh, eventually it made it to Saturn, but... Um, as it was coming into Saturn, it flew by Phoebe, which is one of the outer moons of Saturn, and this was the only time it could actually fly by this moon due to uh, orbits and such. Um, but this is one of the pictures it took of Phoebe. This was when it was arriving, and this was when it was leaving. Um, so these are some of the these were the best pictures we had of this moon. And uh, also, uh, one of the things it did uh, when it got to Saturn is it measured, uh, made a very accurate uh, measurement of the rotational period of Saturn. Um, basically, since Saturn is a gas giant planet, uh, there are no solid surface features that we can look at and see moving around. Uh, there are some storms and such that occasionally come up, which I'll come back to later, but they're not very accurate since they're gaseous and they're sort of moving all around there. So actually, what uh, astronomers do to measure the rotational period of uh, gas giant planets like this is they uh, listen to radio waves, and because uh, apparently they're more... Um, stable or whatnot, um, and they use that to measure the period. In fact, I actually have a recording uh, of some of those radio waves, uh, of course sped up a bit so that we can actually hear them, and of course translated to um, audio so that you can hear it. Actually, I did not plug that thing in, so let me see. Let me, uh, Rick, do you know where that audio cable is? It'll play 8 over HDMI. Okay, if you say so. So um, this, is, this is what Saturn sounds like, uh, sort of. 
Well, no. It's not playing over the HDMI. That's coming from my laptop. But yeah, these are radio signals coming from Saturn. And it sounds kind of spooky, but really it's not. It's just basically information about uh, the rotation of Saturn. And it's also sped up. This is several hours worth of, um, of radio signals, basically, but sped up uh, into about 45 seconds or so. So yeah, that's what Saturn sounds like. But anyway. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. But anyway, uh, so it did that. And that slide is misplaced. That was supposed to be the first one. But uh, no, it's not, actually. I lied. Um, on July 1st is when Cassini actually uh, was captured by Saturn's gravity. Basically, it was, it was already on a trajectory. If it didn't do anything, it was just going to fly right through the Saturn system and keep going like the Voyager probes did. So it had to fire its engines, basically, and slow down with respect to Saturn so it could actually go into orbit around Saturn, and uh, did that on July 1st of 2004. And uh, there was an artist's impression of it doing that. And then the very next day, uh, it went and flew by Titan. So this is what Titan actually looks like. As you can see, uh, right up there, there's a bit of fuzziness, and that is the atmosphere of Titan, the methane atmosphere. And uh, you can see it looks nothing like uh, our moon on Earth or a lot of the other moons you may or may not have seen. Uh, but it did its first Titan flyby on July 2nd, and uh, gave us a lot more uh, data on Titan than we had before. And uh, also, pretty soon afterwards, uh, by the 16th of August, um, so this was July 2nd, so within about a month and a half, it had already discovered two new moons of uh, Saturn. This is one of them. Um, I, I don't remember its name. It's something similar to Mentos, but uh, it's not Mentos. It's something. <laughs> it kind of does look like one if you if you squint at it just in the right in the right way there. But um, but yeah, it had already discovered two moons pretty quickly. And then on October 26th of 2004, it did its second Titan flyby. And uh, this, is, um, this is sort of a radar, an amalgamation of radar images that it took using the VIMS instrument uh, on it. Um, this, this wasn't just from this flyby. This was from later flybys as well. But basically, um, since Titan has sort of such a murky atmosphere, uh, you need radar and such to actually map the surface. That's what it started doing, is uh, pinging it with radar waves and uh, mapping the surface of Titan there. And um, then, on October 25th of 2004, the Huygens probe, which is sort of the big highlight of the mission, uh, detached. Uh, it wouldn't go on to land on Titan for another month or so, but it detached uh, from the probe, uh, from the Cassini probe, and it was already on a collision course uh, with Titan at, the point, at that point. So a few days later, Cassini fired its engines again and basically got out of the way so Cassini would not hit Titan, but Huygens would. And uh, then, a little bit later, um, before Huygens landed on Titan, Cassini flew by the moon Iapetus, which is really a very weird moon, uh, because you can't really see it here, but uh, there are actually two different colors on this moon. Like, here's, here's the uh, leading hemisphere, because this moon is tightly locked, so one side always faces towards Saturn. And uh, this is the leading hemisphere, so the side that's facing, um, it's sort of like sweeping up cosmic dust and whatnot. And uh, the leading hemisphere is brown, but all the rest of the moon is sort of this whitish color. And uh, actually what's interesting about this is we've known this, I believe uh, actually Cassini, the original Cassini, the person uh, who is an astronomer and he uh, watched Saturn a lot, he discovered this moon, if I'm not mistaken. And what was weird that he figured out was whenever Iapetus was on the western side of Saturn, he could see it, but whenever it went to the eastern side of Saturn, he could not see it. And he thought, that's really weird, I can't see it. Eventually, later on, when telescopes got better, he could see it, but it was two orders of magnitude dimmer on the eastern side than on the western side. So he thought, that's weird, uh, why does it get dimmer? And so he guessed, he correctly guessed, that uh, Iapetus had a light side to it and a dark side to it, and that it was tidally locked, and so he was seeing the dark side when it was on the east of Saturn and the light side when it was on the west of Saturn. He was correct in both of his guesses, and of course we figured it out when uh, we sent space probes to look at it. But um, yeah, so, and also you'll notice it has this weird ridge around the equator here. Um, um, 
So it makes it kind of look like a walnut, actually. Some people call this the walnut moon of Saturn. There are a lot of weird moons of Saturn that you'll see, uh, weird features on the moons. But yes, um, on December, 21st, December 31st, uh, Cassini flew by and took a lot of pictures of this moon, uh, the first of many flybys of this one. And uh, Titan was actually the moon that Cassini flew by the most. I believe it had over 100 flybys of Titan in its entire career around Saturn. But anyway, the big one, the one everyone was waiting for, uh, was the Huygens probe landing on Titan, which happened on January 14th. And uh, this is one of the pictures that it took as it was descending. This was about, I think, 16 kilometers or so above the surface. And uh, you'll see this stuff right here. Turns out this, uh, it looks kind of like rivers or such, riverbeds. Turns out those actually are rivers. They're not rivers of water, they're rivers of methane. Now methane is a gas on Earth, uh, basically because it's warm here on Earth, but it's cold on Titan, very, very cold. Um, so on Titan, it's actually not a gas, it's cold enough that it becomes a liquid. And uh, so there are rivers of methane, and it turns out entire seas, well, I should actually call them lakes, because uh, they're not quite big enough to be seas, but lakes of methane on Titan as well. But uh, this is one of the pictures that Huygens captured as it was going down, and this is a picture from the surface of Titan um, that Huygens captured, and you can see some rocks and such there uh, on Titan. So um, also, so, and, and again, none of these pictures would have made it if not for Boris Smeds, that guy I talked about a bit earlier. But it turns out there actually was sort of another technical mess up that happened because um, there were basically two frequencies, two channels that uh, the Huygens probe transmitted all its data back on, and it sort of staggered these pictures so that it took 700 in total, 350 of them came back on channel A, and 350 of them came back on channel B. And due to a software glitch, the Cassini probe didn't listen to one of those channels. So 350 pictures that the Huygens probe took did not get transmitted back to Cassini, and they were lost. So uh, only half of the pictures made it back, but we had some good ones, as you can see. So uh, yeah, as you're going to see uh, here on, there are a lot of technical glitches and stuff that sort of plagued the project. Um, throughout its lifetime. And this is one of them. Half the pictures were lost. And another thing was um, the data that um, the uh, probe, the Huygens probe, was transmitting about basically the atmosphere, the atmospheric density um, and composition and such of Titan were also lost because they were on that channel B that wasn't being listened to. But fortunately, uh, there were astronomers on Earth listening to the transmissions from Huygens. You might be thinking, how the heck can they do that if it's a tiny probe all the way away on Saturn? Well, due to some magical technology called very long baseline interferometry, which is basically where you take radio telescopes all across Earth and you do some sciencey stuff to make them basically become one giant radio telescope about with basically a dish almost the size of the Earth. Um, I don't know how it works, don't ask me, but um, basically they were able to do that and they tuned into some of the um, Huygens transmissions and so they were able to recover some of the data, some of the atmospheric data that was, it was transmitting that the Cassini probe was not listening to due to some software glitches. Yeah, some heads definitely rolled in the programming department of uh, Lockheed Martin or wherever, but uh, anyway. That was the Huygens probe, and it landed on January 14th, transmitted for about 90 minutes or so before Cassini went out of range, and of course eventually it just got too darn cold and couldn't work anymore. But that's okay, they were only expecting it to work for about 90 minutes anyway, and it was mostly successful. So anyway, that was the big one, and to date this is the only, the Huygens probe is the only probe that has ever landed on Titan the only probe that has ever landed on a moon other than Earth's moon, and the only probe that has ever landed in the outer solar system beyond the asteroid belt. So many, many firsts over here. Um, okay, and then uh, there's this other very interesting moon, the second most interesting moon of Saturn called Enceladus, and uh, Cassini flew by this moon on February 17th of 2000 2005 uh, for the first time. And this is one of the images it sent back, and you'll see there's sort of a wrinkly uh, weirdness to the surface. Well, actually, uh, it turns out a lot of this is ice, water ice this time. And uh, it turns out, if you know about Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter, where they think there is a subterranean sea or ocean, well, same thing actually happens on Enceladus. There is sort of a subterranean ocean on Enceladus as well, also made up of uh, water, 
there. In fact, there are giant geysers that actually come out where basically there are cracks in the ice and some of the water escapes. Uh, giant geysers coming out of this moon, and they actually form part of one of Saturn's rings, one of the outer rings, but I'll come back to that later. Um, another thing they discovered is that Enceladus actually has an atmosphere, again, made up of water vapor, mostly. Um, it's not all that thick, but it's substantial enough that Cassini was able to pick it up and uh, made that discovery a little bit later on March 17th on one of its, uh, I think it was either the second or the third flyby of Enceladus. Uh, this was the second most flown by moon. I think there were about 30 or so flybys that Cassini made of it. And also, uh, another thing that Cassini did when it was around Saturn is it, it inspected the rings of Saturn, which here is a false color picture of the rings. Basically what it did is it took its high gain antenna and it got between the Earth and the rings of Saturn. So here's Cassini, here are the rings, and here's Earth way far away. And it basically sent signals back to Earth. And what astronomers on Earth did is they listened to the signals and listened to how they got disrupted, basically, by the rings of Saturn. And uh, they used that to determine what they're made up of. Turns out they're mostly made up of little ice crystals. Uh, not, very, not very large. Uh, the rings themselves are only about one kilometer thick, uh, which is a little over or a little less than uh, a mile. So um, they're very, very thin, but they're made up of water, little water crystals, and sometimes they group together and can form <coughs> larger chunks of ice, which can get up to a meter or so uh, in diameter. But yeah, mostly made up of water. Well, and, the red and the green? I do not know. Um, this, is, this is a false color image, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure really what this is, uh, what the... Yeah, yeah, there are, there are uh, gaps in the rings. I'm, I'm going to get back to that in a minute here. Um, and then the third moon, there was a third moon of Saturn that uh, Cassini discovered called, uh, they named it Daphnis, and it discovered that one on May 10th of 2005. And uh, you can see it also, this is another sort of walnut-shaped moon. Uh, you're going to be seeing a lot of those uh, coming up. And then on September 26th of 2005, it flew by, flew by this really weird moon called Hyperion. And uh, that's, I believe, the second outermost moon of Saturn. I could be wrong about that. But it's also very, its orbit is very inclined uh, with respect to the rest of the moons of Saturn. And it also has sort of a chaotic rotation. Uh, it doesn't have a set period. It just sort of rotates wherever and whenever it wants to. And uh, you can see it has sort of a weird mottled surface to it as well. Um, unfortunately, uh, this was the only really side of Hyperion that Cassini got to photograph very well. Every time Cassini decided to fly by this moon, this was the side that was facing towards it, and the side that was illuminated by sunlight. So uh, unfortunately, we don't really know that much about the other side or what it looks like, but uh, hey, we got to see one side, so that's pretty good. And also, another thing that it discovered were that there were huge lakes uh, of methane on Titan, not very deep lakes. Uh, these lakes only go to about 50 to 100 meters deep uh, of methane, but they're big. So here's one of the lakes on Titan, and uh, this is Lake Superior for comparison. So you can see this thing is really enormous, especially considering how much smaller Titan is than the Earth. It's really huge. Um, but yeah, it discovered there are giant uh, lakes of methane on Titan. So uh, there might be, um, they, they, it didn't find any evidence of life here, by the way, or any bacteria or anything, but uh, it landed on the, um, it landed on solid ground. It didn't land in one of these uh, lakes, though there was a plan for if it did land in the lake, but it didn't. So, uh, but yeah, um, very interesting uh, methane lakes. And this is a picture of Saturn's North Pole that, uh, Cassini took, and you might notice something weird here, specifically this thing here. That's a hexagon. The heck is that doing up there? Well, actually, we've known for a while that there's a hexagon on the north pole of Saturn. The Voyager probe saw it when they flew by. But what the heck is a hexagon doing up here on the north pole of Saturn? Of course, when this came out, a lot of people said, aliens? No. No, it's not aliens. Um, it's completely natural. Basically, it has to do with the complex uh, I guess, vortices of uh, gas in the atmosphere of Saturn. It turns out if you spin uh, fluids in just the right way, you can make many geometrical shapes, one of which is a hexagon. In fact, they were actually able to recreate that in a lab. Uh, here is a video of um, 
basically a recreate a sped up video of someone recreating the hexagon on Saturn's North Pole in a lab. So they're basically spinning some fluid very very slowly and uh, injecting some uh, glow in the dark dye into the fluid. And as you can see, it's forming sort of a hexagon shape around it. So yes. It is completely natural. You can do it yourself. Well, no, you can't unless you have exp expensive equipment. But you could do it yourself if you wanted to. Definitely not aliens, so please stop saying that. Um, anyway, uh, my slideshow is messed up a bit. I'm going to um, redo that here. Hopefully that fixes it. Yep. So here is a close-up image of the vortex that's at the very center of the hexagon. So uh, I would go back and show you that slide, but I don't want to get to, met to get this presentation messed up again. But basically, at the very center of the hexagon, here's a false color image of the very northernmost point on Saturn. And uh, yeah, that looks pretty interesting. Lots of stuff going on there. And then on the other side of Saturn, on the South Pole, there's this thing. Now, as some people called this the hurricane, hurricane in quotes, on Saturn's South Pole. Can anyone see why you might, some people might have thought this was, looked like a hurricane? Yeah, eye wall. Eye wall right in there. Now, of course, it's not really a true hurricane because on Earth, hurricanes form over the ocean. And well, it's Saturn, there are no oceans. And also, this hurricane always stays directly over the South Pole, so it doesn't move around like the ones on Earth do. But they were, it was pretty interesting to actually see sort of an eye wall shape there uh, on this vortex at the very southmost pole of Saturn. So that was another thing it discovered in uh, November of 2006. And um, another thing is that the hexagon uh, later on, much later on, uh, it changed color. So here is a picture of the hexagon in 2013 and you can see it has sort of a bluish tint to it. And then in 2017 it got more of an orangish tint. What happened? Well basically in this time uh, Saturn uh, started experiencing summer, summer basically because uh, the northern hemisphere of Saturn started getting tilted towards the sun. So uh, if you were, if you lived in Australia or something, you'd call that winter. But uh, we we live up here, so we have our northern hemisphere bias. But um, yes, so basically when the hexagon here started getting exposed to sunlight, it changed from sort of a bluish tint here to more of a uh, dark orangish or brown tint over there. Um, and also, another thing was that the original mission was only supposed to be from 2004 to 2008. But when 2008 rolled around, they basically said, hey, we have a perfectly good probe in orbit around Saturn. There are still plenty of things we can learn. Why should we get rid of this thing? Let's extend the mission. And they said, okay, we'll give you funding to extend the mission. And so they did. Uh, they extended the mission for another couple of years, and they called it the Equinox mission, because at that point, Saturn was reaching its, um, I guess, vernal equinox. Um, and so they extended the mission for another two years. And then again, when that mission ran out, they said, hey, let's extend the mission again. And so they did. Uh, they extended it from 2010 until 2017, and that was called the Solstice Mission. And then in 2017, uh, well, we'll get to that later. Um, but another thing that uh, Cassini discovered, or not discovered, but uh, photographed in great detail, was this thing called the Great White Spot. Now this was interesting, I didn't know this before researching uh, this, but the great, white, the great White Spot is basically a giant storm on Saturn that we have been observing since the 1870s. Back in the 1870s, uh, there were the first observations made of this storm, which recurs about once every 30 years, with the about being the key word there. Um, but basically, there's this giant white storm that always appears in the northern hemisphere of Saturn there, and uh, once every 30 years or so. And uh, we've been observing it roughly every 30 years since the 1870s, so apparently it's big enough that you can see it through amateur telescopes when it appears. But Cassini, of course, was at Saturn when it came up again, so it got these really excellent pictures of the storm here. So here it is in uh, October 5th of 2010. And apparently uh, in 2010 there was a really amazing huge white spot storm because it lasted an entire year. And in fact in 2011, as you can see here, it sort of went all the way around uh, the hemisphere. You can see sort of some turbulence from the storm wrapping around Saturn like that. Um, so it got lots of pictures, lots of information on the storm. Uh, apparently it's also, uh, they think that in this storm there is basically a lot of lightning uh, going on in there. So it is sort of truly a storm on Saturn, a thunderstorm of sorts. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's that. And now um, those were sort of some of the major milestones that Cassini did. And now I'm just going to show you some miscellaneous 
pictures in no particular order of uh, taking them that uh, Cassini took of Saturn and its moons. So uh, this is a moon called Rhea uh, of Saturn, and um, it's, uh, I believe, uh, either the second most or the third densest uh, moon of Saturn, but it's not uh, the second or third uh, largest moon of Saturn. And this is one picture that it took. And here's a super, super close-up picture that Cassini took. It took a really daredevil sort of dive towards this moon and came within, I think, 100 kilometers of the surface, which is super close. Um, and uh, here's some detail that it took, uh, detailed pictures of some of the craters on Rhea. And uh, here's another picture of Iapetus. And uh, here you can see that equatorial uh, ridge around it that I mentioned earlier. Now this does not go all the way around the moon. It actually goes three quarters of the way around the moon. Uh, the last quarter of the way around the moon, it's not there. So uh, it's a very weird, very interesting feature here. Oh, and I forgot to mention also, um, the reason it actually figured out the reason why Iapetus has a dark side and a light side to it. The reason is that since the dark side is the leading hemisphere, uh, that's the side that sort of got hit by some debris. Uh, basically, they, they think it was debris from the moon Phoebe, which I showed you way back at the beginning, um, as asteroids and uh, meteorites and such hit it. Um, some of that debris sort of got scattered in Saturn's orbit, and then some of it got swept up by the leading hemisphere of Iapetus. And since it's sort of an icy moon, basically since that lowered the albedo, or basically the shininess of that side, that basically made it, um, well, basically dark materials uh, absorb light much easier than uh, light materials do, because they absorb it instead of reflecting it. And so since it absorbed a lot of light, that over millions of years and such uh, helped melt a lot of the light, uh, the ice on that hemisphere, and that migrated over to the other hemispheres. So that's the reason why uh, the leading side is so dark and the other sides are so uh, bright on Iapetus. But yes, um, here's this moon, uh, this weird little moon called Pan. Hey, that looks kind of like Saturn. Look, it has like a little thing, a moon in here and then like a little ring thing around it. Huh, isn't that a neat coincidence? Well, actually it turns out that is not a coincidence. There is actually a connection between the rings of Saturn and the ring around this moon, uh, and that is because this moon, Pan, actually orbits within the rings of Saturn. It, it, it orbits in one of the little gaps of the rings, and in fact they call it a ring shepherd moon, because basically what it does is it helps to sort of keep the rings in line, basically. If any ring particles get out of line and come near this moon, Basically, the gravity of the moon either flings them back in towards the rings, or flings them out completely, or the ring material will actually start to accrete on the moon. And that's what this is. This is a lot of ring material that got too close and fell and stuck to the moon. And like I said, the, mo the rings of Saturn are very thin. They're less than a kilometer thick. And this moon, I think, is about like 50 to 100 kilometers or so. I could be completely wrong on that. But yeah, so there was basically, the rings are really thin compared to this. So basically, uh, a lot of the material sort of accreted on the moon and formed its own little mini ring uh, around this moon. So yes, not a coincidence at all that uh, this moon sort of looks like a miniature uh, Saturn, if you don't think about it all that hard. But yeah. <laughs> yep. But anyway, uh, that was, that was, I believe that was one of the moons that Cassini discovered, but I could be wrong about that. And then there's this moon called Mimas, and uh, it's got this giant crater on it here. Uh, looks kind of like the Death Star. Um, the Voyager moon saw the, or the Voyager moons, the Voyager probes saw this moon uh, as well, and they saw this crater, which is called Herschel Crater. And uh, some people might think, hey, was this the inspiration for the Death Star? Well, no. Basically, before we had any photographs, well, remember, you have to remember that uh, the Pioneer 11, which was the first probe to fly by Saturn, flew by in 1979, which was after the first Star Wars movie was made. So actually, this has nothing at all to do with the Death Star. In fact, you could say the Death Star was the in, in, uh, in inspiration for this, except, of course, it wasn't. This has been around for millennia, but hey, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but yes, Mimas, um, that's what it looks like, and we got uh, very detailed maps of its surface. Yes? <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah. Also, also, uh, I guess it sort of reassembled itself after it got blown up there. That's the reason why there are all so many craters and such. But anyway, 
Uh, okay, so now back to Enceladus. This is that uh, this is that water subterranean ocean moon I was talking about before. These are some pictures that Cassini took of cryovolcanoes, which are like volcanoes. Well, really, they're more like geysers. Uh, basically, as you can see here, there are cracks in the ice, little fissures in the ice there, and uh, all along those cracks. Um, there is water gushing out, basically, or water vapor coming out here. And this is all along sort of the southern polar region of Enceladus. And what this water ice is doing after it leaves Enceladus is it's actually going on to form the E ring of Saturn. Now this is not one of the rings that you're going to see if you look at Saturn through your own telescope because it's sort of very faint and ethereal and it's made up of water vapor, but Cassini was able to tell it's there. So um, this is, you know, it's a completely different composition, uh, sort of, than the other rings of Saturn because the other rings were made up of either moon particles that came within, or from moons that came within the Roshi limit of Saturn and broke up or other stuff, but the E ring of Saturn comes from water vapor that was originally inside Enceladus. And yes, Enceladus is in the E ring of Saturn. So just remember E for Enceladus. Here's another picture, a uh, better resolution you can see, of some of these geysers coming off of the south pole of Enceladus there. Uh, there it is sort of in uh, the whole moon, and you can see uh, it's uh, coming out of the bottom there. And uh, this is a video uh, take that Cassini took, or rather just a series of photographs that have been stitched together into a video uh, of some of these uh, cryovolcanoes. And this is as Cassini was flying by Enceladus, and also you can see Enceladus rotating just a little bit there. But uh, yeah, there are some of the geysers on the South Pole, and you can see them moving just a bit there uh, in this video. So yeah, uh, pretty interesting that it was able to capture that. This moon is called Tethys, and uh, this also has a large crater on it, but it's not quite as uh, dramatic as the one on Mimas. And uh, Cassini also took a lot of pictures of this, mapped its surface, uh, you know the deal. Uh, Dione, this is, I believe, the third largest moon of Saturn. Someone can correct me on that if I'm wrong. Uh, if I'm wrong and no one knows it, then no one can correct me on it. Um, but uh, that's uh, what it looks like, and it also has some uh, sort of, uh, I guess, ridges or um, canyons, that's the word I'm looking for, on its surface. And uh, this is a photograph that Cassini took when Saturn was eclipsing the sun, uh, as seen from the Cassini probe, of course. And this out here, this is the E ring. Remember, E for Enceladus. Uh, so this is the ring that was made up of the particles, the uh, water vapor that came off of Enceladus. And then that's the G ring and the F ring, and then all the other rings in there that I can't remember. Um, but yeah, that's uh, showing you, and of course the brightness on this is enhanced, it's not actually this shiny, they basically did some photo manipulation, uh, so you're able to see that there. But uh, yeah, it's a very pretty picture it took. So in summary, the Cassini-Huygens mission discovered seven new moons of Saturn that we didn't know about before, uh, improved our knowledge of the composition of Saturn's rings, uh, it mapped the surface of Titan and other moons, and it mapped Saturn's magnetosphere, and it made the first ever landing, the Huygens probe did, uh, on a moon besides Earth moon and the first landing in the outer solar system. And then, once Cassini uh, was at the end of its solstice mission, they decided to do something called the Grand Finale Mission. And this landed from, lasted from April of 2017 up until September 15th. And basically, at this point, Cassini was running pretty low on fuel, and it was sort of outliving its usefulness, because at this point, they had done just about almost everything there was that could be done, and uh, it was still expensive to keep running this, keep funding people to, you know, listen to transmissions from Cassini and whatnot. So they decided, well, let's end this mission with a grand finale. And so what they did was they made a flyby of Titan in such a way that it actually sent Cassini in between the gap between Saturn's rings here and Saturn itself. And it made 22 passes in between the rings there, and it was able to accomplish a few science goals it hadn't been able to do before. And uh, eventually what they decided to do with the probe was they said, well, you know, um, there is a chance that um, this probe still has a bit of bacteria on it because there's a person who probably has the best job title I've ever heard. Their job title is the Planetary Protection Officer and their job is basically for all probes that are going out away from Earth, their job is to make sure that they are as free of bacteria 
as possible because basically um, they don't want to accidentally contaminate a moon or something with bacteria and have it actually live there and grow and then later on when they get there have to wonder gee did this bacteria uh, was this always here or did it come here from earth so basically if any of you guys are star trek fans it's kind of like the prime directive but instead of not interfering with other civilizations it's basically not starting any by accident so <laughs> But basically, no matter how careful you can get, there's still a chance that there was some bacteria, some stray bacteria on the probe, and if it crashed into a moon, it could possibly contaminate it and start some life there, and that would cause all kinds of problems. Oh, oops, they actually landed Huygens on the moon of Tit on Titan, but, uh, well, hopefully, if there was bacteria, hopefully it was just on Cassini and not Huygens, but whatever, we're not going to worry about that. But uh, no, basically they decided the best way to get rid of this thing so that it doesn't accidentally uh, start a new civilization or anything like that would be to fly it into the atmosphere of Saturn and have it burn up. So that's what eventually happened. Yes, I see a question. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure the Galileo Jupiter. Yes, it did. Yeah, and it did the, they did the same thing with Galileo, I believe. They had it fly into the atmosphere of Jupiter and burn up so it didn't contaminate any of Jupiter's moons either. But uh, they did the same thing with Cassini, but before that it made 22 passes in between the rings of Saturn and Saturn itself. And um, this is the final image that Cassini ever took, and you can see uh, basically there's Saturn very, very close. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and there's uh, the, shadow, the shadow of the rings on Saturn there. So uh, when you realize, some people might think that's actually the rings, but no, that's the shadow. So you can see just how close it really is there. And there's the same image, but in black and white. So you can see a bit more detail on the clouds there. That's the last image it ever sent us. And then it burned up. So, but it's okay because they wanted it to burn up. And that was on September 15th of 2017. And it lost its signal uh, I think only 30 seconds after they thought it would. So, uh, and it definitely did burn up in the atmosphere of Saturn. So that was the end of the Cassini mission. So very, very successful mission, uh, despite the software glitches that it had. Still taught us a lot about the Saturn uh, system. And yeah, that's the end of my presentation. So... Um, <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Yes? Um, you said they used radio waves to measure the rotation rate of Saturn. Mm -hmm. What is the rotation rate of Saturn? What did they measure? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. It's probably different um, all through all the latitudes like the Sun. I'm curious what yeah. they used to measure. I, I don't know. Someone, someone look that up, someone who has internet access. But I can tell you this while they're looking that up and covering for my incompetence. Um, <laughs> what they found was interesting because um, they, the Voyager probes sort of did the same thing. When they flew by Saturn, they measured the radio emissions and measured sort of its rotation rate. And then what they were measuring on Earth, as Cassini was approaching, they thought was weird because they didn't get quite the same result. And when Cassini measured it, they also got not quite the same result, the same they were getting on Earth. It was six minutes longer than what the Voyager probes had recorded. So that was confusing. They thought, did Saturn slow down just a bit? Did its day get six minutes longer? No, it turns out it didn't. It was just atmospheric interference and whatnot. Um, but they were able to determine Saturn did still have the same rotational period that it did back in 1981. Um, it was just uh, interference from the atmosphere that made it seem like it was six minutes longer. Now, does anyone have the answer to that question? How, what is the period, rotational period? Ten hours. All right, there you go. Ten hours. That's that's pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's shorter. That's shorter than an Earth Day. So actually, that reminds me also. Two pages of stuff here to read. All right. But yeah. Yeah, that's another thing I forgot to mention. So think about how much bigger Saturn is than Earth, and that's less than half of a day on Earth. Basically, what that does is it sort of makes Saturn fat a bit. It makes it round around the equator, or wider around the equator, kind of like how when you throw a pizza dough up in the air, if anyone still does that, um, it get, sort of stretches out because it's spinning so quickly. Same thing happens to Saturn and Jupiter as well because it rotates really quickly. But yes? All right, so, so it's done by radio rhythms. So I don't think it's got anything to do with latitude only. Hmm. Uh, 
Okay. But I'm, I'm still reading. Okay. <laughs> However, the puzzle, there's a puzzle. Um, the puzzle is, it's about six minutes or 1% longer than the radio rotational period measured by Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft, which flew mm-hmm. by in 1980 and 81. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <clears throat> but yeah. Any other questions? No one? All right. (laughs) Thank you.